Hi, my name is Crystal and welcome to All About Books. I love books and nothing fascinates me more than knowing what inspires writers to write theirs. So that's what I do on All, All About Books is I interview authors to find out firsthand the source of their inspiration. Today I am thrilled to have internationally acclaimed novelist and screenwriter Brad Smith with me. Brad has written 13 novels, and today we'll chat about one of his latest, The Goliath Run, which is published by At Bay Press. And to give you a little taste about what Brad's novel is about, here we go. When a deranged loner killer kills 26 people in a Pennsylvania schoolyard, the country is stunned and devastated. Among those catonic with grief is Joe Matheson, an organic farmer who has lost her goddaughter in the shooting. Sam Jackson, an egotistical right-winged TV talking head, has sliding ratings and faces imminent cancellation. He arrives in Pennsylvania and during a rant, he blames the parents of the dead children. He intends the tirade to be his last salvo, but incredibly, his ratings climb. While Joe watches from her farmhouse in upstate New York incensed, Sam rides the wave, shouting that it's time to take the country back from the left-wing weaklings who don't have the courage to protect their children. When he is asked to run for Congress, he accepts and amplifies his message. Watching these developments in horror, Joe finally decides that there actually is something she can do. She kidnaps Sam's 10-year-old daughter. Ta-da! So Brad, welcome to All About Books. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, Crystal. Thank you. So I'll just start off. I'm absolutely fascinated, Brad. You draw from a variety of experiences. You've worked across Canada, the US, Africa at a variety of jobs. Railway signalman, carpenter, bartender, truck driver, ditch digger, school teacher, farmer, maintenance electrician, and a roofer. How have all of these experienced in experiences influenced your writing? Well, first of all, Crystal, thank you for pointing out that I was unable to hold down a job. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, a good, that's a good question because I write blue collar fiction. Um, I guess probably more, more of a throwback to, like I never, I never went to university or college, I'm more of a throwback to somebody like Steinbeck or or Woody Guthrie, who's a songwriter, who, who basically learned about people by traveling around and working uh, different jobs, which, uh, yeah, they were basically blue collar jobs. So I, th I think it gives me an insight into um, how people operate, especially on different levels, you know, whether they're white collar, blue collar, whatever. Um, I've always liked working with my hands. So it's been, it wasn't something that I set out to do, you know, it wasn't like I was gonna say, okay, I'm gonna do a whole bunch of blue collar jobs and I'm gonna become a novelist, you know. I just yeah. started doing blue collar jobs and I like to travel and um, I ended up, like you said, all over the world. And it turned out in retrospect to be a good thing um, when I started writing, but that, that wasn't the goal. It was just when you're traveling around, you need money. So you become a bartender, <laughs> you become a, I actually started teaching school in uh, Revelstoke uh, as a supply teacher because they were, they were snowbound. A buddy of mine was living out there. He was teaching school and they were snowbound and uh, they ran out of teachers basically. <laughs> <So> oh. <laughs> I, I, I told them, I may have fibbed a little bit about my, my background and uh, they got me in and then I ended up teaching a class of, uh, of kids who had washed out of the main school. They're a little bit delinquent kind of and uh, so they could kind of relate to me on that level I guess. <laughs> so I ended up teaching them for a few months and uh, it was a great experience. Fantastic. And you were also in Africa during a very interesting time, just um, just before the apartheid ended. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Brad? 
Yeah, I've been working for the railway in Canada in the CNR uh, as a signalman. And my uncle, uh, Bill Smith, was uh, he had a grade eight education. And he, he ended up being one of the top three signal, uh, produce, uh, signal designers in the world. He designed the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in San Francisco. He, he designed the L system in Chicago, like some of the most famous um, systems in the world, right? And he was, after he was forced into retirement at 65, he got hired by a company in South Africa to design a railroad system that ran from the coast above Cape Town inland to the iron ore, iron ore mines. Up until that point, they'd been using um, the South African Railway to get their ore to, to, the, to the coast because most of the ore were shipped out, most of it went to Japan. And believe it or not, this was in the late 70s, the South African Railroad still had steam locomotives. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was literally like landing in Wyoming in 1890 or something, right? Wow. So anyway, my uncle Bill designed the system and, they, and he said to me, you've been working on the railroad in Canada, do you want to come and work for me? And I said, absolutely. So I went there, I spent a year there helping put the systems in. And it was, it was a real culture shock for a lot of reasons, apartheid particularly, right? But even the, the just different things, there was always a joke, we were about to land at the Johannesburg airport, set your watch back 25 years. Oh, geez. <laughs> it was it was really different, but it was a it was a great experience. It's just a beautiful country, um, and, you know. Aside from the political problems that they had and, and still have, but it's getting better slowly. And how do you think that has influenced your writing, specifically being there during the apartheid? Um, it opened my eyes. We we I mean everybody knew about apartheid. You took it in high school, but to be mm -hmm. living day to day was was very different and. Um, I got into a little trouble there. I used to get in trouble here and there. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I started hanging out with, the, with uh, some of the, the black guys. They were just more fun, you know. We were maybe smoking <laughs> some left-handed cigarettes and drinking beer, and um, that was kind of frowned upon. You know, you're not supposed to, you weren't really supposed to, uh, to socialize too much because these guys worked for us. I was kind of a foreman to them. And there were a few things there that took some getting used to because I didn't have the freedom to do things like I did here. So yeah, it, it opened my eyes. You can read about something all you want, but when you come face to face with it, it's, it's much different, you know? Right, right. Now the Goliath Run, what inspired you to write the Goliath Run? Uh, believe it or not, people think it's, it's got a lot to do with Trump and the, the final version does have some Trump in there, not a lot. I actually started writing it before he was elected and I was just getting so frustrated with the partisanship and in both countries, Canada and the States, but mainly down there. And the character, some of these right wing TV talking heads like uh, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson, those guys, you know, they're just so partisan and they, they rely so much on not telling the truth that it was, it, was, it was really frustrating me. And so I decided I was gonna write something about it. And I wrote the first draft of this book in 19 days. And then I set it aside. And I worked on it after that, obviously. And um, it got turned down by just about everybody in the States. But my, my American agent sent it out. And uh, it starts off with a school shooting, like you said. And they just said, we're not interested in publishing a book about a school shooting. And I said, but you don't mind seeing them on TV every other week, right? Um, so why, you know, why hide that away? And the other, the other complaint was uh, the lead character, Sam Jackson, was too cartoonish. And I said, well, as of November 2016, <laughs> you can never say that again about anybody. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness. So I, was serendipity, I, I'm a huge believer in serendipity being a big part of life. I was, uh, I was asked to blurb a book by a, a woman whose family I know, a woman named Janet Troll, who's a very good short story writer, um, by her publisher at Bay Press in Winnipeg. And so um, I blurbed her book because it deserved a blurb. And I was invited to the launch. And when I was leaving, the, the, the publisher, Matt Jordry, said to me, I know you're publishing out of New York nowadays, but if you ever got something you want to show us, give me a shout. So a year or two later, I basically had exhausted all submissions for uh, the Goliath Run. So I gave him a shout. And he said, yeah, let's have a look at it. And about three days later, he called me up and said, yeah, we want to publish this. <laughs> I love that. Serendipity. <laughs> I think that's incredible. So is Sam based on a collection of characters or anyone in specific? Then? More of a composite, I would say. Yeah. 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 But you can, it doesn't take much to see which ones he's a composite. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. Because <laughs> I know when I was reading, I kept thinking, what is this guy going to do next? <laughs> you never knew. And you know, since I, since I wrote the book, as bad as it was then, it's 10 times worse now. You know, it's just mm -hmm. uh, the, the misleading the lies, you know, it, it's just uh, amazing. And people don't seem to be able to see through that. I, I mean, I, it's very puzzling to me. Why not? You know, when, when something is blatantly that untrue, you think that you catch on after a while, but it doesn't seem to be happening. No. Incredible times we're in now, that's for certain. Um, now, Brad, you have, you're going to read for us today. And I was wondering if you could share before you read um, the, why you picked the, this passage that you've picked. Okay, well, I picked a passage. You, you, kind of, you, you did a good fall, uh, you did opening line when you read off the jacket. I thought you would just keep reading the book. <laughs> um, so I did, I flowed through it. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit right after the daughter gets kidnapped. Uh, okay. She was with her her limo driver. The, the, the family, Sam Jackson family, is extremely wealthy. And she disappeared while she was at the limo driver. That, that's what they, they think. And so I want, I've chosen to read this place because I'm going to introduce a guy named Bell, who is a cop who becomes very active in the investigation. And most of the time when I read about cops, I'm not that kind. <laughs> Bell, is, yeah. Bell is a very good cop. There's yes. also a cop in here, an FBI agent, who's not that uh, likable. And I also want to introduce, uh, the, the little girl's name is Vanessa, who gets kidnapped. Um, I want to introduce her mother, who's kind of in the, one of these relationships where it's puzzling because she's this smart, capable person, and yet she lives with this guy who's a bit of a racist monster. And he sometimes, you don't even know if he's a racist, or he might pretend to be a racist to cater to his base, you know? And you're, it's, it's one of those puzzling things I've thought this in, in a lot of relationships, like public relationships, you wonder why people are together. And this is, a, this is a, uh, an example of, of a relationship like that. Okay. Are you ready? We're ready. Okay. Now that I'm in my late 30s, I have to wear reading glasses. <laughs> you believe that late 30s thing, then <laughs> I should be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> the kid is dead, Olson said. <clears throat> Bell was driving, moving across town on 96th Street in heavy traffic. They got in the call while they were at the station, just coming on shift. First, they'd driven to the office of the car service to talk to the manager there, and now they were heading for Sam Jackson's house on the Upper West Side. It was a few minutes to seven, and the streets were moving at a glacial pace. You don't know that, Bell said. I know stats, Olson said. Three hours in, 99% of the time, the kid's dead. Assaulted, strangled, tossed in a dumpster of the river some variation of that scenario. You're a cheerful fucker, Bell told him. It's in my blood, Olson told him. I'm Scandinavian. Bell glanced over to see if he was making a joke. He and Olson had been partners for less than two weeks. Bell didn't know the man, aside from seeing him around the station. He was in his 50s, pushing retirement, Bell would have guessed. From where, Bell asked. Sweden. But you were born here, Bell suggested. You first generation? Hell no, my family came here in 1897. And it's about time you cheered up, isn't it, Bell said. Olson shrugged. I'm just telling you that the girl's dead. I'm not so sure, Bell said. If this was a random grab sex thing, then I might agree with you. But this feels different. How so? The celebrity angle for one, the money factor for another. And there's this disgruntled driver who'd been given notice. Maybe he's the perv, Olson suggested. Maybe he is, Bell admitted. There were a couple of uniformed officers at the Jackson house. The wife's name was Rachel. She was on her feet in the living room that opened into a huge kitchen. A tall, good-looking blonde, early 40s maybe. The place was nice, the furniture and fixtures expensive and tasteful, which surprised Bell somewhat. He'd seen Sam Jackson's TV show and he was expecting something garish, gold taps, nymphs and fountains, like Trump. Presumably the wife was in charge of decorating though. She was understandably on edge, but dry-eyed. She had a friend there with her, a skinny brunette with puffy lips and artificially tanned skin. There was a pot of coffee on the island that separated the rooms and a box of pastries from Starbucks. Bell guessed that the friend had bought, brought the food. Olson took the uniforms aside and talked to them before telling them they could go. Rachel Jackson watched them leave and then turned to Bell. You guys are detectives then? What have you found out? We talked to the manager of the car service. The car isn't back. It's him, Rachel said. It's that driver. She indicated the door just taken by the uniforms. I told them that. 
Yeah, and they told us, Bell said, we're checking him out. Sean McElroy, right? You recently gave him notice? That's what this is about, she said. That vindictive bastard took my daughter. You might very well be right, Bell said. Then why isn't that man in custody, the brunette demanded. Bell looked at her, wondering if the Botox had seeped into her brain. We do not know where Mr. McElroy is at this time. He turned back to Rachel. As of right now, we don't have the car, and we don't have McElroy, and we don't have your daughter. We do know that McElroy was bonded, which means he doesn't have a record and that he's not a registered sex offender. If he did this, we should hope that he's just, you know, teaching you a lesson, in his mind anyway, and maybe after money. What kind of a person would do that, Rachel asked. What do you know about him, Olson asked. Did you interact with him? Not really, Rachel said, just to say hello. My husband thinks he's a boozer. Olson glanced at Bell. McElroy's boss had suggested the same thing. Rachel pulled a cell phone from her pocket and walked away as she punched in a number. She stood looking out a bay window for a moment before turning back to them. Why doesn't she answer her phone? Olson walked over. Your daughter has a phone with her? Of course, Rachel said. It goes right to voicemail, which means he turned it off, or maybe he destroyed it. Did you tell the officer she has a phone? Olson asked. No, I didn't think so. I didn't think to. They didn't ask? No. All right, Bell said. We need the phone number. We need the server and the account number. We can trace the phone. Even if it's turned off, she asked. It might get turned on, Olson said. Can you get us that information? While she went into another room, Bell looked at the brunette. Friend of the family, he asked. Yes, Lila DiMaggio. DiMaggio, related to the clipper? Clipper, she asked. You mean like a barber? Never mind, Bell said. He indicated their surroundings. Where's the husband? He's in Wyoming. The brunette was quite dramatic in her body language, her manner of speech. But on his way home as we speak, he's a very famous person, you know. She glanced towards the other room, then leaned close to Bell and whispered, and they're very well off. That's what this is about, if you ask me. This driver wants money, which is a good thing, right? I mean, as opposed to it being a sex crime or something like that. Before Bell could respond, Rachel returned with the paperwork on the daughter's phone. Olson took it from her and sat down at the island with the cell to call it in. Bell watched as he poured himself a cup of coffee and took a scone from the box while he waited for somebody in the tech department. Bell turned back to Rachel. Her lips were tight, her breathing measured. He could see that she was doing her utmost to keep it together. I want you to tell me what happened when you gave McElroy his, his notice, what he said, how he acted, anything you remember. He asked for another chance, he said. And when I said no, he said I wasn't being fair. Was he pissed off, Bell asked, raising his voice? Did you feel threatened? He was more whiny than pissed off, like the world was against him, one of those guys. One of those guys, Bell thought. Those guys don't usually abduct children. They're more likely to be found on a bar stool somewhere telling their tale of woe to anybody who will listen. But Bell couldn't know that about this guy McElroy. There were exceptions to every rule. At the island, Olson hung up his phone. He sat there with his coffee. Obviously, he was okay with Bell doing the dirty work. Bell turned back to Rachel. All right, there's something we need to cover here, he said. I apologize in advance, but I have to ask, is everything okay with you and your husband? What are you talking about? Is there a chance that your daughter might be with your husband, Bell asked. It happens sometimes when couples aren't getting along. This isn't one of those times, detective, she said coldly. Sam's in Wyoming. He announced three days ago he's running for Congress. I'm not sure when he would find time to abduct our daughter, even if we were having problems, which we are not. Okay, Bell said. Olson's phone rang and he picked it up. Yeah, he said, and then listen. No shit. We're on our way. He hung up and looked at Bell. They found the car, parking lot in Williamsburg. Rachel moved towards Olson, her bottom lip quivering. Vanessa, she asked. No, Olson said. He looked at Bell, but they found the driver. He's not our guy. Why not, Bell asked. They found him in the trunk. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thank you. Um, I was really interested. I really liked, I, I liked all of your characters. I thought they were very multidimensional. I liked Belle, Henry. Um, but people, like, people like Henry a lot. Yeah. One of, maybe he's one of those guys that kind of surprised me. Yeah, but I was really, in particular, I was fascinated by your choice of female characters. Like Sam is surrounded by some incredible women. His wife, He's got a, a daughter. You're, you've got a, um, a kidnapper who's a female, Joe, and his campaign manager, Molly. 
all female. Why did you choose to surround Sam by so many incredible women? Uh, well, we talked about Rachel a little bit because I wonder what, yes. uh, why a woman stays with somebody like that. Uh, Molly, I wanted, I mean, Molly could have been a man, but I wanted her to, to butt up against Sam because Sam, Sam is not, doesn't treat women very well. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a smart, aggressive woman to stand up to him, which she does. Yes. Um, Joe, it worked because, because of what happened to her goddaughter. And she was so close to her goddaughter, and I just felt it was a better fit and more unlikely for you to think that a woman would do what she did. Yes. And, and when you think about it, she's kind of surprised at herself for doing what she did. But you could also see that her heart was really breaking. Her heart was totally broken. Mm -hmm. And so that was what drove it to her. So I, I think because of the type of guy that Sam Jackson is, <clears throat> I wanted to have that kind of distaff side standing up to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as a reader, I, I really enjoyed that. And also as a reader, um, your pacing is, is just brilliant. Like from the start of the novel right to the end, everything's bang, 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 bang. Um, how do you do that, Brad? <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Um, you know, somebody smarter than me said writing is rewriting. Um, I will give credit to my, uh, one of my former agents, uh, Jennifer Barkley, who read the book. And I started it out um, with the party for the little girl's birthday. And right. she said to me, no, you have to start with, with the shooting. And then the shooting was really, really hard to write. Like I have nieces and nephews and it was, it was a, probably the toughest thing I've ever written. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think she was 100% right because that was the way to start the book. So that, that was a pacing issue. And yeah, just editing, you know, when, when you go through stuff, when you put it aside and you go back to it, you can kind of tell what works and what doesn't work. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you think I got I got to do less with this character, but I got to do more with this other character, you know? And yeah, like writing is rewriting. Yeah. And you can tell that some books haven't been rewritten. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've also just released another award-winning book, Cactus Jack. Well, it hasn't won anything yet. It's just come out. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Kid Cooper was lucky. I, I was fortunate enough to win some stuff. Uh, Cactus Jack is a little bit lighter, but it's got some, some themes to it, too. It's, it's kind of about rich people and poor people. It takes place in the world of thoroughbred horses. Yeah. It's about, uh, a, it starts with a guy who, who through some complicated um, shenanigans, has a colt that was, that was sired by the best thoroughbred racehorse in the world. But this guy's broke. He's got, he's got a little farm of 30 acres and not any money. He's been estranged from his daughter, and he dies. And then she inherits everything and she, all she wants to do is sell everything and pay off his debts because he was so much in debt. But a, a rich, entitled guy who's never done anything in his life decides he has to have that coal. And she's going to sell it to him and then she gets to know him a little bit and realizes that he's a misogynist and a racist and a whole bunch of other things. And she says, well, I'm not selling you the coal. I'm going to stick around. I'm going to race this animal. So that's, that's the genesis of the, of the book. And I, I love thoroughbred racing. I've been going to the track for years. And, this is a bit of a bookend to a book that I, I wrote in uh, Come Out in 03 called All Hat, which we made, was made into a feature film. It was at TIFF in uh, 2007. I wrote the screenplay. I uh, starred Keith Carradine and uh, uh, Luke Kirby and Rachel Lee Cook. So this is a little bit of a, the bookend to that book. Okay. Different characters, though. Okay. So for all of the book lovers out there, what I'll do is right down below, I'll post links to Brad's website so you can learn more about Brad and all of his other books and also where you can purchase a copy of his book. Uh, Brad, a great big thank you for being on All About Books today. I really appreciate your time. It's been fun. Well, thank you. It has been fun. I enjoy, and, I enjoy doing this. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I have another book coming out in a year, so you'll have to, we'll have to do it again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And for everyone else, please be sure to like my video and subscribe to my channel, All About Books. Thank you.